Some of my fondest gaming memories come from Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. The bulk of my time with the series was spent with Explorers of Time that's updated re-released Explorers of Sky, which I'd argue are some of the finest games in the DS. I'd love those games to death. However, before those I did play the original Red and Blue Rescue Team games, and yes, both. I know they're basically the same games, just one is on the GBA and one is on the DS, but the whole experience was just so incredibly fun that I didn't mind doing it twice. You're a human who has been turned into a Pokemon, with that Pokemon itself determined by one of those personality quizzes that your HR department swears by. Explore dungeons, recruit Pokemon to your team, learn the wonders of diagonal movement, and save the world. It's a charming adventure that's made nearly infinitely replayable by its dungeon structure. See, the Mystery Dungeon title's most defining trait is that the dungeons have a randomized layout that changes every time you go through them. And in the PMD games, there's a bunch of dungeons and a whole variety of Pokemon to meet, battle, and potentially recruit. If you really know what you're doing, you can beat it in an afternoon. But if you want to truly sink in and experience all that PMD has to offer in any of the games, whether you're playing the original Red and Blue Rescue Team games, their Switch remake, or any of the later DS and 3DS games, you can easily spend dozens upon dozens of hours just playing through each of these titles. It may come as a surprise that Red and Blue here were not the first Mystery Dungeon games. There were 11 different Mystery Dungeon titles spanning four different non-Pokemon series that predate Red and Blue Rescue Team's release back in 2005. Today I'd like to take a look at three of these across three different series to answer the question, what was the first Mystery Dungeon game? For those unfamiliar with the Mystery Dungeon series, the mention of randomly generated dungeons earlier may make you think of a genre that's become way popular in North America. Roguelikes. You know, stuff like Hades, The Binding of Isaac, and Enter the Gungeon? That's for good reason, as the Mystery Dungeon games are literally intended to be Japanese roguelikes. Developer Chunsoft, well, Spike Chunsoft, was started by a group of developers who famously created the first five Dragon Quest games. And after a positive experience playing the game Rogue, the 1980 computer game that's the namesake of the whole roguelike genre, it's in the title, developers Kuroichi Nakamura and Seichiro Nagahata, goodness I butchered those names, I'm sorry, were inspired to try doing their own take on the genre. But instead of diving immediately into that original Mystery Dungeon release from 1993, instead I'd like to skip forward to 1999 and work our way backwards. The first game I want to cover today is also the first Mystery Dungeon game not to be based on a property created by Chunsoft. Originally released for the PlayStation 1 in 1997, this is Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon, a Final Fantasy spinoff featuring everyone's favorite big yellow flightless bird. As for why a spinoff was made featuring a Chocobo specifically, I wouldn't be surprised if the popularity of Chocobo breeding in Final Fantasy VII played a part here. That said, this is a PS1 game that never got a release in North America. It did, however, get a black and white portable port to the Bandai Wonderswan in 1999. And as it just so happens, I have the perfect excuse to take a look at that version today. So before we hop into the first of these Mystery Dungeon games, I need to actually open a box. This was sent to me by Arctic Cave Gaming, and as you'll see, it does pertain to this video. I should mention he's not sponsoring this video, just reached out to me and wanted to send a really cool package that I'm super excited to open. So let's just slide this here. Got that open. Let's open it up. And inside the box, we have another package. Ooh. So let me just open that up. And now, ooh. I knew there was one game coming, but there's two. We have two different Wonder Swan games. We have Chocobo Mystery Dungeon. And also, oh, this is so cool. Mega Man Battle Network WS, an English copy. This is so cool. Now, I should mention, I currently only own a black and white Wonder Swan, so this is more reason to get a color or a crystal now. But thankfully, today, the game we're looking at is Chocobo Mystery Dungeon, to start, anyways. This is an English translation of this original game that, obviously because it was on the Wonder Swan, 
uh, this version of it was left in Japan because the Wonder Swan itself never left Japan. This is so cool. These are English versions of these games. If you want to learn more about the Wonder Swan itself, I've covered it multiple times before in the past and even have a Wonder Swan playlist that you can check out here. With that, let's get into Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon, or as it was called in Japan, Chocobo no Fushigi na Dungeon. I'm going to go ahead and stop trying to pronounce Japanese for the rest of the video. In this game, which I'm emulating here because like hell I'm going to try recording a non-backlit screen, you play as a Chocobo named Poulet. It's literally just the French word for chicken. You're joined by a money-hungry Moogle named Atla as you arrive in a small poor village. It's overwhelmingly inhabited by other Chocobos. After arriving, you and Atla, weary from your journey, go to stay at an inn. Except, uh-oh, it's a trap, and you get transported down into the mysterious dungeon below. And the game from there is pretty simple. Every time you die or escape from the dungeon, you respawn right outside the entrance in the main town. Here you can go to the shop, interact with villagers, store items, and even save your progress. Pretty similar to your main town area in most of the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games, so it is rather small. Where things really differ from those later titles is in the dungeon setup. Stuck in a dungeon is this hat-wearing Chocobo, who is the husband of the lady Chocobo who runs the town shop. Every four floors or so, you'll encounter him along with the chance to buy and sell items, which is much appreciated as your inventory space fills up really quickly. There's also this guy here, who I guess mostly just exists for the sake of tutorials. Throughout each randomly generated floor, you'll encounter enemies. Combat here, in a very Final Fantasy-esque fashion, is defined by equipables, magic, and an active time bar. There's a decent variety of equipable weapons and armor here, and you find it spread throughout the dungeon. However, chocobos don't have thumbs, you can't wield a sword or a hammer or whatever. Instead, you have equipables such as saddles and talon accessories. As for magic, throughout the dungeon you'll find spellbooks and tarot cards. The cards are single use and have effects like stunning or if enough are sold to the main town shop, summoning frogs everywhere. The spell books are also technically single use and contain typical Final Fantasy spells like Blizzard, Fire, Thunder, and Arrow. Each spell has a corresponding magic stat that levels up every time you use a spell book, encouraging you to use spells liberally against enemies to make future spell uses on future runs just that much more powerful. The last major component to combat here is the active time gauge. Most Mystery Dungeon games operate in a very traditional turn-based fashion. You approach an enemy and whoever reaches the other first attacks, and then you just go back and forth until someone dies. Here however, the system is based on the ATB system that was used in most Final Fantasy games from the SNES and PS1 era. You can, in theory, spam the attack button your chocobo will swipe at enemies, but a chance of a hit connecting or being as powerful as possible is unlikely. Instead, if you wait for the ATB gauge to fill, you'll almost certainly have a powerful hit connect. The active gauge also pops up when using spells, and it's also used by enemies. This gives Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon a level strategy not found in most other games in the series. Well, I don't know, maybe level of strategy isn't the right term here. Perhaps type of strategy is a better way to put it? Coming into this title after mostly only playing the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games previously, I absolutely found myself approaching enemy encounters often a little more defensively than I did there. It became less about landing as many attacks as possible, and more about how many powerful charge attacks I could get to connect while keeping my enemy's ATB gauge in mind. What may put off some Pokemon Mystery Dungeon fans is also how exploration works here. Notice how when I've talked about the game here, I've used the term Dungeon Singular. That's because there are only two dungeons in the game, and you'll spend a lot of the game really just with only one dungeon available. The first is merely 30 floors and is pretty tough to get through on its own. The second and final pre-credits dungeon, however, is much more brutal. It's a 60-floor behemoth with a cursed chocobo sitting at the very end as a final boss, and of course if you die in either of these dungeons you lose every single item you've collected, save for ones in storage. Though you can skip back to whatever floor you were on every time you re-enter the dungeon, I think keeping your level in mind is way important. A good rule of thumb is to keep your chocobo's level around the same number as whatever floor you're on. I know there's some things I'm not diving into here, such as the item recycling mechanic, how the town grows and changes as you sell more items and explore more, or the post-game dungeon that is supposedly endless, but this isn't supposed to be an end-all be-all walkthrough of the game. We have game facts for that. 
Rather, I'm wanting to use this dive here and the next two games to show how these compare with the Mystery Dungeon games I grew up with and how I feel they stand out in their own. And Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon does have a lot of things people love in games like the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon titles. An easy to understand, hard to master concept, special abilities to learn and use, a setup that can probably be beaten in a few hours by experts, but that your average Jamie could sink over 30 hours into easily. It even has familiar mechanics such as a hunger system and health that restores as you want. And this game even has Judaism, how about that? It's not as expansive as a lot of the later Mystery Dungeon games. Again, you have a grand total of two main dungeons, and only a single character to play as with no recruitable companions. But it's a really lovely little experience. I haven't even commented on the look and sound of this title. Thanks to the capabilities of the original Wonderswan, the vibe comes off a bit like if Pokemon Mystery Dungeon had been released for the original Game Boy. I'm really here for it. What perhaps makes the Chocobo Mystery Dungeon games odd is that, for the most part, Chunsoft didn't work on them, even though they're considered part of their Mystery Dungeon series. For this first title, only Square is credited for development. In the later Final Fantasy Fables Chocobo's Dungeon for the Wii, development was done by Studio Hand, who I think also came back for the Switch game. The only one Chunsaw seems to have worked on was Chocobo's Dungeon 2 on PS1, which by the way was the first Mystery Dungeon game ever to come out outside of Japan. And even then, they just kept the name as Chocobo's Dungeon 2 in the West. That's weird. This fan translation of the Wonder Swan version was done by the team of Andrew Higsby and Special Agent 8. They've done some truly phenomenal work here, and if black and white handheld games aren't your style, they have an English patch for the PS1 version as well. Or, you know, if you'd rather stick to Pokemon, they have English patches for the Japanese exclusive Wii releases of the Pokemon games. That's really neat. Outside of Pokemon, Sharon the Wanderer may be the most iconic Mystery Dungeon subseries. While it's not as mainstream as the Pokemon titles, I'd say the fanbase here falls more into the cult following category, it is a series that continues to see new releases to this very day. Well, I don't know, maybe new releases is being a bit generous. The past few Sharon the Wanderer releases have actually just been re releases of Sharon the Wanderer 5, which first came out in 2010 for the DS, and then the Vita and then the Switch, and now on mobile. But hey, speaking of the DS, there is a remake of the original Sharon the Wanderer game on there too. Sharon the Wanderer is different from most other Mystery Dungeon games. Instead of being based on another series, this IP was created by and published by Chunsoft. And to this day, this series is often seen as their baby. Originally released for the Super Famicom in 1995, the original Sheeran game is set in feudal Japan and follows adventures of a wandering Ronin named Sheeran and his talking weasel companion Kopa. Kappa. Uh, something like that. You must explore a large 30 area dungeon spanning across towns, swamps, forests, and up a mountain to reach a rumored lost city of gold. That is also apparently the home of a mystical wish-granting being known as the Golden Condor. Instead of that original Japanese exclusive SNES version, for the sake of this video, I'm playing the officially localized English version, which was published by Sega in 2006 for the DS. Also heads up, this game kicked my ass. Repeatedly. Sharon the Wanderer is mostly based around one dungeon, but saying it like that doesn't do it justice. For one, if you do somehow manage to beat it, there is a bonus dungeon in the postgame, along with a tutorial dungeon at the very beginning. But second off, though if you die, you restart the town at the mountain's base, there are other towns throughout the dungeon, so while the adventure can be rather tough, you can at least rest assured there's time for a breather every few floors. If I had to compare Sharon to any western roguelike, I'd probably go with Hades. Sure, there's only one dungeon per se, but the environment changes as you go through it, and characters will grow and change throughout the game. If you know what you're doing, or you know, pull a gaming in the Clinton years and cheat, the game is ridiculously short. And yeah, if you die, you lose all your items, unless they're being stored at a warehouse. And yes, when you die, you get reset to level 1. But part of the fun of Sheeran, like Hades, is the tough difficulty. It's way tougher than any of the average Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games, but that's fine, as it's a different kind of beast altogether. Meet a long-lost brother, woo a bar maiden, think about the logistics of an inn not only opening near a mountain peak inside the mountain itself, but also charging an equivalent of $2,000 a night. Holy shit! And thanks to those diverse, changing environments, the whole adventure feels less like going through one big saming dungeon, and more like a bunch of mini dungeons. Again, kind of like Hades. Something I appreciate a ton about Sharon and the first Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon is that they're relatively story light. 
Sure, the characters can help enrich your adventure, and I recommend talking to everyone you can, but if you're just here to grind a ton and see how far you can get on each run, then nothing is stopping you from just hopping on in. I absolutely appreciate how easy it is to just jump in and start a run through the dungeon. It looks and sounds gorgeous too, especially on the DS. Most of the gameplay just happens on the bottom screen. The top screen is mostly just used for a general map and really only feels necessary during the occasional cutscenes, but that's fine. Also, after playing that black and white title earlier, these colors really seem to pop for me. Also, really found myself appreciating little details. There are once again armors and weapons, and Sheeran's appearance changes based on what he has equipped. Something I haven't talked about is running. Yeah, most mystery dungeon games have a run button and you aren't limited to just walking, but running itself is always a little jank. You hold down run and not only do you move fast, but so do all the enemies around you. And is it just me or does this look a little choppy? Anyone else? Just me? I don't think Sharon the Wanderer will be everyone's tea. That's firmly based on the difficulty, and that's fine. Some people play games to relax, some play to blow off steam, some people want a heavy challenge, some don't, and however people get what they want out of gaming varies from person to person. So while Sharon the Wanderer killed me over and over and over again, sometimes feeling downright unfair with enemy onslaughts or my belly emptying right as I ran out of food, assuring me certain death, more often than not, I immediately found myself right afterwards gearing up for another run, ready to take on the dungeon again. That said, if I'd played this as a kid, I totally would have rage quit and given up, or whipped out the action replay. And here we are back at Chinsoft's roots, Dragon Quest. One character from that series was Terniko Taloon, a character who has appeared throughout the series and become a bit of a fan favorite. Perhaps helps as well that he was introduced in the massively popular Dragon Quest IV. Sometimes I forget how much things used to change from console generation to console generation. Anyways, Taloon here is a kindly, hardworking family man who wants to do whatever he can to give his family the best life possible and make a good bit of dough along the way. In his first Dragon Quest appearance, he sets out an adventure after hearing about rumors of valuable treasure. Though not defined by greed per se, he's absolutely a traditional merchant at heart, and he's often rather opportunistic, for better or worse. These traits all carry on over to this original Mystery Dungeon title. That's right, the first game Chunsoft ever developed under the Mystery Dungeon moniker was Tornico's Great Adventure Mystery Dungeon for the Super Famicom. And technically speaking, this one got two different sets of direct sequels. Yeah, even though it had pretty much nothing to do with Dragon Quest, the original Sheeran the Wanderer game was referred to as Mystery Dungeon 2 in its first release. That's not to be confused with the later Tornico The Last Hope for the PS1, which is often referred to as Tornico Mystery Dungeon 2, if only because the game that followed was named Tornico's Great Adventure 3. Also, all but the second Tornico's Mystery Dungeon have been Japanese exclusive, so for this video I decided to play a fan-made English translation of the original Super Famicom release. And uh, my god, this translation is not good. Really, the whole thing is downright weird. There's not a lot of misspellings or anything, just whoever did this really doesn't understand how word and line formatting work in this title. Some words are smashed together into mega words, almost like someone is poorly trying to apply German spelling conventions to English. And sometimes instead of there being a line break, you see the literal words page break show up in a text box. It's awkward. The gameplay is really solid though. Even this early entry, most of what you'd expect from the series is in place. It even has kind of that Mystery Dungeon look and sound, if that makes sense. Like if you put this one next to some of the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon titles or some of the other PS1 and SNES era Mystery Dungeon games, it really fits right in. That's impressive for a first outing. There's technically just one dungeon here. I mean, there is a tutorial dungeon, Sheeran had one of those too. And there's a bonus dungeon if you beat the game, but for the bulk of the adventure you'll be going back and forth through the same huge single dungeon. And yes, every time you leave, whether by death or warping out, you get reset to level 1. However, as you warp back with more and more items, what expands throughout the game is to loon shop in the surrounding town. As you play more, you get to explore more and interact with more people outside the dungeon, and it's really lovely. It's really nice to come back from a hard day's work down into dungeons below searching for treasure to meet some new NPCs or catch up with some old ones. Or, you know, it would be if what they were saying here was comprehensible. 
Equipables here are pretty similar to the ones in Sheeran. Along with handheld weapons and shields, you have arrows which you can just throw at enemies, and you also have these magical rings that grant certain abilities. The only issue I really encountered here, and it's a problem in most Mystery Dungeon games, but especially so here, is with item management. Sure, you do have an inventory and it's really easy to navigate, but it feels like it fills up way fast. And like, I enjoy myself a good bit of inventory management, don't get me wrong, but few things are as annoying as loading up on valuable items with no return herbs in sight. Usually when looking back at long-running series like this, the first title is always really janky in comparison to later titles. Kind of rough to go back to, you know. But translation issues aside, Tornico's Great Adventure is actually really solid. I mean, it's difficult. Perhaps not to the extent of Sheeran, but definitely enough for you to white-knuckle the controller at points. And the world here really is charming and has its own feel. That's something I really appreciate about Mystery Dungeon as a whole. As similar as all the games are gameplay-wise, the size of the series and the sheer number of IPs it stretches across gives it a huge amount of variety. Some titles are easier romps with more bite-sized dungeons, well, before the post-game anyways, and there are entries that are more cartoonish, and there are also entries that have a darker tone. There are entries that remind me a lot of modern roguelikes in the best of ways, and of course there are entries that both follow up on beloved characters from existing franchises while giving them new and exciting adventures of their own. It's crazy how far back the series stretches, too. I know many folks, myself included, probably had no idea that Mystery Dungeon itself existed until those first Pokemon titles came out. Also, and before someone in the comments goes, you know, Jamie, technically Dragon Quest IV was the first Mystery Dungeon game, right? Look, I love a good technicality, but this is ridiculous even by my standards. So if you'd like some more Mystery Dungeon content, the same day that this video goes out, I will be releasing a short video on the Lost Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Gold Rescue Team for my patrons, channel members, and Discord folks. I've had a little bit of an influx of supporters lately, as you can see from this list right here, and that really means a ton to me, and I wanted to figure out a way to just show how appreciative I am. So I figured I'd start doing short exclusive videos to accompany my main releases. So if you'd like to become one of my supporters, you could do so for as low as a dollar a month through the links in the description below. Oh, and one more thing before I go, and yes, I know these end slates are becoming a little long-winded. I'll try to be more mindful of that in the future. But hey, if you enjoy geography-focused content, these past few months I've been a writer for a recently launched channel called Faultline. We're a small team over there and I think we're making some truly unique original stuff, so definitely check us out if you get a chance. So on that note, thank you very much for watching, stay classy, and I'll see you next time.